This is Talking With, Brian Lamb's conversation with historian Douglas Brinkley. Episode 5 starts after this. Let me ask you about um, the places you taught and just a very brief reaction. Tell me what you remember about Hofstra on Long Island. Um, That the president, James Stewart, and a dean um, there that I became very fond of, that they just embraced me fully. And that meant a lot, meaning the love of the administration. This was this was risky for any administration to unleash a guy like me. What could go wrong, right? A bunch of kids on a bus traveling the country with the university. And they went with it. And, uh, and then later they came and gave me an honorary doctorate from Hofstra for the magic bus because, um, you know, it became a big success. Tulane. Um, Tulane... You know, it's a just New Orleans. I want I just, the city is so spectacular and so fun. Um, but at the university itself, you know, it was um, it's good students. It's good. Um, I had a better time though at when I first came to the University of New Orleans. That was at first before you went to Tulane. Yeah, because I had a. Um, that's where Ambrose had been, and he was retiring, and I took over the Eisenhower Center, and that we were collecting the oral histories of World War II vets. Now, the Magic Bus doesn't have much to do with the collecting of World War II vets, but I was able to fold this program into the Eisenhower Center because Steve thought it was a great idea. Uh, Steve Ambrose wrote the book on the Lewis and Clark Trail, and he traveled the entire Lewis and Clark Trail. I went with them on a big hunk of the trail, and it was great. How'd you go? Uh, we went by um, canoe, uh, and we went over Lolo Pass. We did hiking. You know, Steve got very... I later went the whole Mississippi River with Steve. He was a real believer in this, that you take people to go. So you got to get the young people excited about history. How'd you meet him? Um, I met Steve, liked my books on, he at heart, Ambrose was a Cold War historian, uh, famously wrote a two-volume biography of Eisenhower, and three-volume on Nixon, um, and I met him at American University here. I had delivered um, a paper on the Berlin Wall crisis. I met Steve at that meeting, and then um, we stayed in touch, and I was teaching at Hofstra, and we, at Hofstra, you asked what I remember about it. We do these great presidential conferences. Still done. Yeah. And I did was in charge of the one on Theodore Roosevelt, which was a really good one because TR lived at Sagamore Hill just down the road and it had a lot of local interest. And uh, But I think I, Ambrose, I believe it was the Nixon one, um, I believe. Um, and they may have been a different president, uh, but he... He was up there, and we talked, and he said, I want to, um, can you have dinner while I'm up here? And he said, I'll stay an extra night, because I told him I had to run this conference and doing this and that. And he said, I'm just going to hang an extra night. So we had dinner in Garden City, New York. And he said, uh, you're working on a book on Jimmy Carter, and that's, uh, he's in the South, and I'm retiring, and I want you to take over the Eisenhower Center. What was the Eisenhower Center? It was Steve's idea to collect D-Day, Battle of Normandy, oral histories. And really expanded it into Battle of the Bulge, on and on, but collecting the European theater at first, uh, oral histories of World War II vets, which Steve correctly used to say, I wish we had a tape recorder at Shiloh or, you know... Chancellorville or something and taped what occurred, we did have the opportunity to do, due to communication to get the real stories of all these vets. You would think somebody would have been doing that, but nobody was. Ambrose was like the one that started interviewing and interviewing all the World War II vets. It was a, it was a great project that he initiated, and it led to the birth of the National World War II Museum. How did he end up but, in New Orleans, and why the Eisenhower Center at the University? Of well, New that's a uh, Steve was a um, colorful character. He came up during the What's 19th that mean? century. Um, there's an eccentricity to him. He did his. He played football. He's from Wisconsin. Played football uh, linebacker at the. Um, for the Badgers and was good, 
starting, you know, linebacker. He then went on into history and uh, worked with um, the famous um, um, T. Harry Williams, the biographer of Huey Long, he worked with at uh, Louisiana State. And one thing led to another, but Steve then worked with Milton Eisenhower at Johns Hopkins, the brother of Dwight. And Steve wrote some books. He wrote The History of West Point, still the best history of West Point. Eisenhower wrote the preface to Steve's book on the history of West Point. Um, But he then moved out to Kansas, and he got thrown out of the faculty at, um, at Kansas because he was part of a group that heckled Nixon coming to campus over the Vietnam War. He didn't like Nixon? He did not like the war. And it became a very famous incident because he was really with a lot. He was a military historian with the Eisenhower brand. Um, Looked like he was made to be a Hollywood, um, you know, Spielberg used to say that Steve looks like he's, you know, John Wayne or something. And, And he was part of a faculty group that was boo, boo. And got noticed, and they gave him a reprimand, and all who, of this. Who gave him a reprimand? The um, administration officials. Why would they do that? Because they tenure? disrupted the president's speech. Did he have tenure? No. And he got um, left there, and it, it wasn't a very good thing to have on your resume that you got, you know, trying to get a job, and you they they weren't going to recommend you because you did that your last place of employment. Uh, but the University of New Orleans hired him, and so he was very grateful. And then he he built this incredible career up for himself. Uh, uh, and Eisenhower and Nixon, who he actually ended up liking, except for the war, uh, as he matured and, and grew older. But he caught he was caught up in that fervor of that era, you know. And um, and so in New Orleans, they let you be what you are. And Steve would was eccentric in the sense when he would often wear. Like when he wrote on Meriwether Lewis, he tried to wear an outfit the way Lewis would wear an outfit. Or he would wear, you know, he would like really do immersion history, like fall into, uh, you know, uh, you know, and sometimes I thought he, you know, he could talk like Nixon and Eisenhower. He had them, he, when he lectured about them, he had their voices perfectly. And he would bring a dog to class and the dog would sit there and go retrieve students' papers. And the dog would go, when you put the paper down, the dog would put it in Steve instead of the kid walking up. <laughs> That's what I mean by eccentric. Uh, you know, students loved that about him, but uh, it, it, he never fit in. Steve was his own guy. He was he, like He died early. Died of cancer. He would smoke. Uh, died in his 60s. <sighs> One after the other, the cigarettes light uh, and, uh, and light them up. But he was giving up the. He was quitting. And but in, uh, back to the Garden City dinner, he said, "I said, well, I'm I'm in New York at this point. I was living in uh, New York City in Manhattan, and um, and he said, look, I'll double your salary. Whatever your salary you're getting at Hofstra, I'll double it. All oh, that got my attention. You know? <laughs> I started making, justifying it, you know, Eisenhower, Presidency, Carter's in the South, you know, New Orleans. Uh, and uh, Money talks. Yeah, money talks. So it was, uh, uh, and he said, look, but if you don't like it, I'm going to hang out for a year. You come down, I'm going to run the Eisenhower Center for one year while you're there, show you what's going on, and fair enough, if you don't want the job, leave give you one one what year was this um this was 93 what year did he die i can't remember right now but i want to say 2000 and two something like that and you took over the eisenhower center maybe what, uh, maybe what year? maybe I, three i can four. look it up but uh, it's okay uh i took it over right after he who stepped down in the 90s, and I was I ran it, and I ran it a little more um, also doing American studies aspects to it. Uh, we would hold a lot of conferences. I, for example, had Kurt Vonnegut, who wrote Slaughterhouse, and Joseph Heller, who wrote Catch-22, come down to talk about their World War II experiences, and 
you know, I was doing some other things. Steve, meanwhile, got involved with building this World War II museum. And then I was on the board of the World War II museum. So I got to see how a museum gets built from the scratch up. By the way, he died in 2002, you're right. He was 66. <clears throat> so what's that? What's there? If you went to New Orleans, went to the Eisenhower Center, went to the World War II Museum, what are you going to see? It's spectacular. I mean, we built in New Orleans one of the great museums in the world. Um, Nick Mueller, who was a good buddy of Steve Ambrose, really was the uh, CEO, energizer of it all. But they put together a top-flight board. I was just the young interloper. These were like heavyweights from the corporate world. Um, they got congressional funding. It was Ted Stevens of Alaska who really, and in a way, um, of Hawaii that really pushed to get some of the federal funding, matching funds. But we made the great decision. It was going to be built on Lake Pontchartrain, and the idea was we can rebuild the Higgins boats that landed at Normandy and People could crowd on 36 and go on one of those boats, see what it was like. Uh, the little boats that landed on the beach. Yeah, and that's why it's in New Orleans. <clears throat> Andrew Jackson Higgins was from New Orleans, and Higgins Industry built these um, the boats, the landing craft boats that um, would have, like, let's just say 35 um, soldiers in it. And they're very, we rebuilt them. But they're very, they were built kind of not flimsily, but they were built for a purpose. There are not a lot of them around. They're, they've all deteriorated. Uh, but they would just come right in the open and then you'd storm the beach, and, and it's iconic. Um, and that, those boats were built and designed in New Orleans, and that gave Steve the justification to build first a D Day museum, and then it, it, it was so popular, it merged to the National World War II Museum. And it now is a major American tourist draw. I mean, the, the two of the best museums for people in the country are the World War I Museum in Kansas City and the World War II Museum in New Orleans. It has, you know, five theaters. You, it's, we, it collects war footage, letters, memorabilia. I deal still uh, at least monthly with them because people write me I have all these letters of my grandfather, you know, that what can I do? And I always say, deposit them there. It's the best place to have uh, soldier memorabilia, letters, things to go, and they archive it. But the money came in, Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg became impresarios for it. Uh, Who funds it now? Um, it's it, they do, it fundraises. I mean, they have a lot of corporate support. Um, it's be, you. It's a museum that just grows, grows, and grows because of the corporate support. There's not a company that doesn't want to support um, honoring our World War II vets. So you taught at Tulane. You taught at the University of New Orleans. What did you teach? Um, always the same American history, uh, Brian. But I break it up. I've taught over the years. My mainstay, I guess, is Cold War history. But I do history of the presidents. Uh, I've done civil rights history, uh, environmental history. Um, those are really the core one. Military history, and I break them up. Right now, I mean, my core courses. I'm the last few years. I'm doing one class on the 1960s and 70s, and then a class on presidential history. Before we leave the the bus trips and all that, as you look back, what was the most successful? Uh, one stop as far as you could see the reaction of the students well we there are many but one that came to mind so we went to Plains Georgia to build a habitat house um, with Jimmy Carter and he would make catfish for us and he would tell us to eat the catfish you know you hold the catfish and pull it and and something about all the students thought he was a good man a humanitarian so they were all on best behavior around Jimmy Carter you know what I mean everybody was like we dress better and um, and we built a house and the students got out there with the hammer and the sun and you know we would you know Carter's both of them were helping and Millard um, Fuller who was creator of Habitat and I, it was pretty special. And they, like one night we were all eating in Carter's, like I have to take a call from Cuba. And I think he had a call with Castro. 
So he came back, from, told this, my students about his call in, in, um, to Cuba at that point, where they were like, oh, my God, you know, it was a secret service around while we're building the house type of thing. Right in planes? Uh, it, it was done in Americas, uh, right, right next close. to planes, yeah. Okay, what's another stop? Um, well, one that ended up having long-term ramifications in my life is we would stop in Whitty Creek, Colorado, and see the gonzo writer Hunter S. Thompson, and Hunter would not autograph his books. He would shoot them, and so they read Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, and he would put it up against a tree and go, Poof! and half the students thought, what an idiot. He sh- you know, this is what a stupid stunt, but then about half of the students like, oh my God, it's so cool. Hunter Thompson shot my book. Um, and out of that, I realized Hunter had an uh, alcohol issue, uh, alcoholic, and, um, and um, had a great archive of material but didn't know what to do with it. So I was, he asked me if I would come back sometime and help him organize it, and I ended up doing two volumes of letters of his, one called The Proud Highway, one called Fear and Loathing in America. But that introduction to Hunter grew out of the magic bus. I want to come back to <clears throat> Hunter Thompson later, but there was an incident in a Holiday Inn, I believe, where somebody, a couple, gave you a copy. Was it Hunt, uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas? Wh- or which one did? Yes, that's what, the one What's that story? And how did that, what, what was your reaction to that? I'm not sure I remember. Um, go, tell me what it was. Well, you just, I, all I remember is that somebody gave you a copy of the Hunter Thompson book that got you interested in him in the first place? Um, well, I don't know. You know, that was more, that was Jack Kerouac's On the Road. I okay, was, On the Road. I got it mixed up. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I was <laughs> but working, the idea, of, <clears throat> yeah, excuse me, the idea of somebody oh, out yeah. of the blue saying, here, kid, yeah, you, you ought to read I this. I got that handed to me when I was at, worked some at a Holiday Inn in Perrysburg, Ohio as a banquet porter setting up tables and they how old were you um i got in as soon as i could i wanted to work um i 17 i guess whatever the law was i got in working i'd work as many hours as humanly possible rain snow sleet um i just couldn't believe i could get cash like (laughs) making money uh and uh and so we would put up the tables and um but somebody then handed me the book on the road by jack kerouac i had mentioned uh somehow of about liking bob dylan and they had had the book and then just gave it to me uh, as gifted it to me and it was special so i've done that occasionally to people and out in respect to that if i finish a book and if I'm on an airplane, I got a book in my bag. I'm talking to some younger person, or so. Oh, here's a good book I just read, and just give it to them. I had somebody give me a, a book of a French writer Celine on a train in in um, Europe once. You know, you're reading, and you're talking. Well, oh, you haven't read this person, you know, here and read it. But that fit in on the road a little bit to the magic bus too. It's the idea that in America the roads has a romantic appeal to go s- travel and see America by the road and uh, you know I'm, I'm, I even now I'm, I'm, I'm getting this age in life would love to write the history of Route 66 and tell the story of that road you know so I'm, I'm interested in these things I'm interested in Eisenhower's interstate highway system I mean I'm interested that the longest highway in the world is I-90 that connects um, you know Seattle to you know to boston and and we don't think of that it's the longest in the world but that one strip is and uh, and i miss the back roads the blue highway to the um, william least heat moon uh, you know the find the road not taken and do that too but the interstates make travel convenient go back down to the university of new orleans from there you went to rice uh, I went to Tulane, <clears throat> and I ran a Theodore Roosevelt Center at Tulane, and uh, I met my wife, Anne. I had written a book on Rosa Parks, um, and that's an interesting story in itself because on these magic bus trips, um, we would, I would take kids to students to Montgomery, 
And there was one road sign that said Jefferson Davis Boulevard in Winmeet Rosa Parks Avenue kind of thing. And you take a photo of that. But there was no memorials for Rosa Parks. And I couldn't believe it. And then I would look and there were honestly about 200 books on Martin Luther King Jr. And there wasn't one serious adult book to read on Rosa Parks. She wrote a book with Jim Haskins called um, About Her Life. She wrote her own autobiography, but no scholar had ever looked at it. So out of that, we, I then had the temerity to bring these students and bang on a door of the housing project, really, uh, 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 where she lived during the Montgomery bus boycott. And a couple answered, and um, they were very nice. And I said, can my students see? And it's so tiny. Rosa and Raymond Parks were living in just like a shoebox in Montgomery. I mean, and that brought you home to how she had no funding. She was, you know. Did all the uh, kids go in the house? Yeah, they let her in. They were living in there, and they let us see it all. You know, we, uh, I did that by myself not too many years back when I was in Chicago to the birthplace of Walt Disney, uh, where he was born. And I took a, I had a car take me, and I just randomly knocked on the door and uh, there were open and there was like Mickey Mouse memorabilia, but this family just lives there. And they said, oh, you want to see it? And they said about every two weeks, somebody, usually from Europe, comes and bangs on their door. But I went and I saw the bedroom where he was actually born, Disney and the place. I do things like that. It's, uh, uh, But it, we, we um, I then started realizing I wanted to write a book on Rosa Parks. Let me come back to her later. Okay. Uh, but go back to oh, uh, Tulane. Tulane and then... To Rice? Yeah, Tulane and then from Tulane to Rice. Now, you've been at Rice, if I calculate right, 14 years? Yeah. You're in the Baker Institute. Yeah, part of it, and the History Department. And the History Department. But you have said, I've seen you in many interviews, say that you are center-left politically. Yeah. What are you doing in the James A. Baker, uh, the third <clears throat> institute? Oh, you know, I have a lot of, uh, uh, well, first off, James Baker's an incredible person to talk to. I was telling you about Dean Acheson and Paul Nitz. Uh, I mean, I think as Secretaries of State, George Schultz and uh, James Baker III are outstanding Secretaries of State. They were just outstanding. And um, and Baker and I uh, got along well, get along How'd well. How'd you meet him? How'd you get into this? Um, I went... Let me see. So um, the it really was more about the Rice University recruiting me, the president, David Lebron, and wanted me in the history department. But in order to get the proper position, they wanted me to double, you know, be in history and in their public policy center, which was is named after Secretary Baker. Um, Bush 41 was living there by Rice in Houston. Um, and so the public policy center Baker ran. We, it, he would bring in world leaders all the time. I mean, it's astounding. These young people get to just meet everybody. I don't. I'm talking across the board. Current world leaders he would have. You know, if somebody prime minister of Japan comes to Washington, they might end up giving a talk for James Baker on campus, and students get to interact. It's pretty special, and. Um, yeah, Baker has written me letters of recommendation for things in life and the like, and uh, um, they call him Bake. Uh, the, the, if you're going to do the right biography of him, I always would title it The Velvet Hammer, because uh, that's really what he is. He's very um, um, genial and kind and warm, but if you get into a business thing with him, look out. He's a tough Cuffed customer. But you live in Austin, and this is in Houston. How do you do that? Well, in between, the big event when I was at Tulane was Hurricane Katrina. And, uh, you know, we, we felt the deprivations of that in, in, all, in, in endless ways. And at that time, I was getting offers from universities quite a bit, like almost poaching me out of Tulane, people saying, we'll offer you this and this. Um, I was debating between a few um, schools, but Rice, my big thing was I wanted to do three classes every fall and then zero. 
because I really wanted to do writing and research. And if you can't do it with 2-1. So Tulane told me you could keep doing, we will, we'll do 2-1. And I said, no, I'm, being, I'm not bluffing. I'm leaving if it's not 3-0. And Rice Baker and LeBron offered me the, the 3-0. And at that point, I loved rice, but for one thing, Brian, I have, um, I have asthma, and I, it was in remission for most of my life, but I went in to help house clean and debris from Katrina, and it got into my lungs, some of the debris, and I had to go to the a, a Jewish Memorial Hospital in Denver for respiratory. And I just don't want to breathe bad air because of that. And Houston, with the refineries plus the humidity, you know, I, I just thought if I have a choice, it came, dawned to me, could I live in Austin, uh, which is more amenable to my interest, which is hiking, kayaking, outdoor living, um, and, and could I do that as a commute? And I could if it was 3-0, meaning if it was, I only had a commute in one semester. See, if I had to do it the other way, I would have would have moved to Houston. So we moved to Rice. We had three children, and I just decided, kind of a maverick fashion, I want to raise my kids in Austin. I picked the city where I wanted to raise them from all of my travels. And then I love Houston. It's a great cosmopolitan uh, center. Obviously, I just wrote a book on NASA and going to the moon, and, you know, I'm engaged in it. So I feel I'm blessed to have both cities in my life, which is, is exciting. How do you I get love back both. And forth? I just drive. I leave Austin at about nine at night and I'm in in two and a half hours. I listen to the radio. Uh, I used to call my mom um, all the time on the commute because she likes to talk for about an hour and it's uh, and that would eat up the, some of the clock. And it's, it, now I enjoy it, particularly the drive from Austin to Houston. Coming home you know, I'm I'm less interested because you start hitting some traffic getting out of Houston. Douglas Brinkley is an American historian and author. You can listen to more interviews with him by searching his name in the video library at cspan.org.